Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar of the S&P 500, the Nasdaq bouncing higher after ending last week in an oversold condition. Another heavy earnings week this week. McDonald's on semiconductor on tap today. Apple coming up this Thursday. Also, the Fed meeting to think about. Finally, we'll do a live Q&A here in a short while on today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey there, everyone. Happy Monday and welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Quite frankly, if you can see me right now, I'm surprised you can because I am hidden, in fact, in the studio here. Happy Halloween week. We've got a lot to think about in terms of market dynamics. We've got the Fed meeting Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Wednesday afternoon, of course, is when we get the uh, latest update from the Fed. We have Fed uh, Chair Powell's press conference, which often creates a lot of movement. Within that sort of uh, uh, mindset, we also have a bunch of earnings, and it's not just random companies. It's names like Apple, semiconductor names, a lot of uh, sectors, a lot of market cap represented this week. After the last two weeks with a lot of the uh, magnificent seven names, four of them so far uh, reporting uh, as we go through this earnings season. So a lot of potential catalysts on top of that situation in the Middle East continuing to escalate. You know, speculation about that becoming a growing conflict with the implications of Higher oil prices usually coming uh, as a uh, as a um, side effect of that, or as a as a, a big result of that, if, th if things do escalate. So, how do we make sense of the markets in this sort of environment? An article I wrote on StockCharts.com uh, on Friday, really related to innocent till proven guilty, or guilty until proven innocent. I think in a bull market phase, you think of the market as innocent until proven guilty. Things are okay until they're not. In a downtrend, in a bearish phase, you assume the market is guilty. You assume the market is going to go lower until you see enough evidence that tells you that we're probably going to rotate to the upside. That's the mindset I hope you've made the switch to, and I would encourage you to think of that, certainly on the short-term, kind of medium-term time frame. I think as I was talking with Tom Boley here in the studio last week, the long-term implications for equities, I think, pretty good. I, I have no doubt that my kids will see stock prices higher than where they are today. I think that's fair. Uh, but what does that mean in the medium term, in the short term, where a lot of us are trying to identify opportunities? I think that's where the, where the uh, waters are pretty muddy. We'll review some of the evidence today. Again, a nice bounce off of oversold conditions. So let's get to the market recap uh, here in a moment. I do want to go to a poll question. As a reminder, by the way, we do have the chat open. We're going to go to the live chat here uh, in just a few moments, and uh, we'd love to answer one of your questions. So get them in there now while the getting's good. We asked you recently in our uh, a poll, uh, the TTM squeeze indicator is based on which two technical indicators? Bollinger Bands and RSI, Keltner Channels and Bollinger Bands, Keltner Channels and MACD, or Keller Channels and OSU Bands. The last one I made up, uh, and while I was in the band at OSU, uh, there are no Keller Channels that I know of, and if so, not something I created. Uh, Keltner, uh, his channels, which are based on volatility, based on uh, relative movements, uh, certainly uh, part of it. Bollinger Bands as well. And what TTM Squeeze Indicator, what it does, uh, John Carter of Simpler Trading created this indicator and really popularized it over the years. It combines Bollinger Bands and Keltner channels. And basically, when one is inside the other, that's a certain configuration uh, called a uh, TTM Squeeze. The squeeze is on. You need to take action. If you want more information about indicators like the TTM Squeeze, that is actually featured in our ACP platform uh, for Stock Charts members, you have access to that uh, and many other indicators as well. You need to go to the Advanced Indicator Pack uh, that uh, Stock Charts uh, provides. And the way you get there, by the way, is in ACP in the bottom right. You'll see this little plug. These are all the plugins. You'll see the Stock Charts Advanced Indicator Pack. It is indeed free for all of our members. So you click install, that'll set it up there. And we have a number of other premium plugins as well. If you want to know more about what I just said as I was uh, teasing the TTM Squeeze Indicator, two things I would point you to. Number one, you can always look for help with a little magnifying glass and just uh, type an indicator or type a particular thing that you want more information on. Uh, make sure you go to our uh, chart school section and we'll tell you more information about what it is. We'll give you the formulas and explain all of that as well. Also, I interviewed uh, Daniel Shea here a couple weeks ago, I want to say, and we actually talked about the TTM squeeze in a number of her appearances. So if you go back to that interview, she actually did a really good quick one minute primer on, uh, on how to use that indicator and how she uses it around earnings release is pretty timely for right about now. Let's continue on with our market recap. And again, we're going to get to the live Q&A here after the recap. So 
Get your questions in now if you could. Please be nice to me. I just witnessed the Brown Seahawks game yesterday. I'm a little, I'm a little emotionally sensitive still after that one. I was, I was honestly very cheering for both, uh, both teams. In the end, my Seahawks outplayed my Browns, uh, which was a tough, a tough, uh, tough ending. Uh, so be nice, be gentle if you're going to be in the chat uh, talking football. Let's continue on with the recap here. The S&P 500 up about 1.2%. So nice bounce higher, right? After last week where the average day was all about distribution, and I would still still argue, I think, as I mentioned, the, the guilty versus proven innocent. I think that's a great kind of general way of thinking of a market in this environment because there will be a lot of bounces off of new lows. Those are called bear market rallies. They are super uh, quick they are super severe and they are super seductive. It is so easy to get drawn into that, which is why I think stepping back and really looking for the weight of the evidence to change to more bullish uh, is important. As a swing trader, buying quick mean reversion is your game. I don't wanna sway you from that. Being oversold on a Friday, betting on a bounce early this week makes a ton of sense to me. Uh, but if you're more of a medium term investor, I would be thinking of this within the context of the downtrend that we've been really tracking uh, over the last, uh, really the last couple months, to be honest, but magnified, I would say, in the last week. So the S&P closing around 4167, that's up 1.2%, about the same gain for the NASDAQ composite, mid caps, small caps, all up as well. The S&P 600, uh, the uh, lowest of the three, but still up 0.6%. The VIX back below uh, 20. So the VIX continuing to toy with our emotions as investors, going above and beyond that sort of key first point, right? I always look at a VIX of 20. If we're above 20, that is a high volatility, high uncertainty, generally speaking, risk off type of environment. A VIX below 20 is low risk, low volatility, uh, usually sustainable bull market type of condition. So we are literally going back above and below that key level that I pay attention to as a general guideline of, uh, of volatility. So for now, technically back to low volatility, but I think you just have to be patient and see which way the VIX breaks from here. I would say if we rotate lower, particularly if the comments from the Fed on Wednesday, um, you know, sort of shocked the market a little bit to the downside, if there's a lot more speculation about inflation and the economy that is still overheated relative to what uh, the, the Fed has been looking to, uh, to control, uh, you know, maybe that weighs on stocks very, very quickly, at which point the VIX would probably spike to the upside. Uh, let's continue on looking at some other asset classes. The yield curve overall moving a little bit higher, drifting higher today. The uh, 30-year yield, the long bond yield around 5.04%, 10-year yield around 4.9%, five-year yield around 4.8%. That is a common question we've gotten about, um, you know, wh how, why the yields are quoted this way. And, um, you know, just so you know, this is the, a traditional quoting from the CBOE. That's where we get these uh, real-time updates on, uh, on interest rates because there are products that are based off of those uh, particular levels, and this quote makes more sense to the options that are tied to them that the CBOE is trying to uh, promote. Uh, but basically, 50.35 means 5.035%. It's quoted in 10 times the percentage yield of the uh, underlying security, the long bond or the 10 year, whatever you're looking at. Bond prices, of course, going down when yields are going higher. The dollar coming down as well. And honestly, the dollar index, not really a lot of movement in the last month, right? The last couple of weeks kind of been sideways. Crude oil prices, honestly, more consolidating than anything. Gold is the one out of the three that's really started to move. And we've highlighted that on the show with the GLD really starting to, uh, to improve. Pulling back a little bit today as we get to the commodities page. The uh, GLD gold was down 0.6%. Silver, uh, the opposite, up 0.8%. Crude oil prices moving lower. Uh, the broader commodity ETFs mostly moving lower. Uh, this is weighing on energy stocks, which uh, in general tend to follow the price of crude oil. So we're actually seeing a rotation lower in the USO, finishing the day around 76. That's down almost 3% uh, from yesterday's close. Finally, cryptocurrencies hanging in there. I mean, Bitcoin is up uh, around 34,400, we'll call it. It's down about a half a percent, but over the weekend, really remaining in the upper end of the range we've been for the last month. Ether prices right around 1,800. So we've seen this, you know, again, incredible rally in Bitcoin uh, and, uh, and some other cryptocurrencies over the last week. Much of that, I think, driven by speculation that there will be a Bitcoin ETF in our future. Still no specifics on that, still no confirmation on that theory, but the Bitcoin's certainly rallying here very quickly in the last couple of weeks on that expectation. I would argue that is the big 
you know, sort of the big uh, upside catalyst we're waiting for. Just not too long ago, we saw that uh, fake headline that came out or a headline that was proven to be inaccurate uh, saying that an ETF was approved. You saw Bitcoin spike immediately and then come right back down. So I think there's pent up demand or pent up recognition waiting for that moment. Uh, so be looking for that. Again, it's good argument for uh, upside for Bitcoin from current levels. Finally, looking at sectors, we have communication services up 2%. Nice update, nice way to lead the, uh, the market higher. Financials, number two, up 1.8%. That's a little unusual. The financial stocks have not looked particularly good. A lot of these that are pushing higher are coming off of very beaten down levels. So, you know, just at the bottom of the, your, your dashboard, when you look at stock charts, it's interesting to see which types of names are leading and which are lagging. I'll show you that in a minute and why I have my, uh, my dashboard set up that certain way. Consumer staples, number three from the top. This is a bit of a, of an, um, you know, not a great validation. Staples up one and a half percent. Again, I'm just always skeptical when I see the market bouncing and I see defensive sectors near the top. That tells me it may not be sort of the risk on sort of uh, takeaway that a lot of people are assuming uh, when you see the market move higher. At the bottom of the list, you know, all 11 sectors higher today. Real estate, energy, healthcare lagging behind the uh, benchmarks. Healthcare was that last one up uh, about half a percent from Friday's close. I mentioned sort of stocks that are up and down, and uh, you know, I was just talking with uh, Grayson Rose, uh, who who really helps with a lot of the the development priorities here at Stock Charts. We were looking at uh, the new version of the uh, the dashboard, which will allow for a little more customization. Uh, we uh, have a whole project called Panels, where we actually allow you to customize objects, create your own dashboard. It's super exciting, uh, and uh, our development team is working on that uh, as we speak. But one of the things we, uh, we were talking about is just how I use the dashboard. And one of the things that I pointed out was I like looking at the stocks that are up and the stocks that are down. And just as always, I mean, during the course of the day, I'm glancing down here and just seeing which names are working and which names are not. I'm looking for mega cap names like an Amazon or a Nike, uh, you know, really uh, working, uh, working pretty well. I'm looking for names that have been lagging big time that all of a sudden are on the top 10 list, like a Goldman Sachs, which was making a new low on Friday. All of a sudden, counter trend moved back to the upside. Then I'm looking at the names that are really giving, uh, giving some of the gains back. And some of these like on semiconductor, like Albemarle, ALB, um, uh, what else, NXPI, these are names that have actually been in a downtrend for quite some time. So they're losing today, but this is just the latest step down in a falling down the hill sort of experience that uh, these stocks have had. So recognizing if it's more of a continuation of an existing trend, more of a mean reversion play, stocks like Goldman Sachs beaten down, popping higher, names like Amazon, which have been some leadership that have pulled back a little bit, thinking about what that means today versus the broader uh, scope of things, I think is very, uh, very important. All right, let's continue on here. Just finish up our market recap, looking at a couple charts. I want to show the S&P 500 here. And again, I wrote that article on Friday. I would encourage you to check that out on the articles tab. I forget actually what I called that. Oh, here we go. My downside targets for the S&P 500. Not the most creative title I've ever come up with, but it is, it is very descriptive of what I wrote about. Basically came up with three downside targets based on the trajectory of the markets up until now. Some of these use Fibonacci retracement levels. Some of those use uh, you know, previous support and resistance levels. 3,800 is one of those levels that we talked about because not only does it line up with um, you know, previous support, but it also is a Fibonacci level looking at the big picture like the last three years or so of, uh, of market history, three or four years. So a lot to, to think about there. But you know, overall, again, for now, on a day like today, the way that I would think of this day is a counter trend move off of the lows, right? When you look at in a downtrend, a, a move to a new swing low will often coincide with an oversold condition because we're in a downtrend. So there's a lot of selling. Uh, it's not hard to make a new swing low. That counter trend rally to the upside often comes right after that point, which means not surprising giving Friday with the RSI below 30, similar to what we saw back here in early October. We had a bounce of a couple days before the next leg higher. And I think at, at least getting some bounce early this week makes sense. Of course, this is taking us right into the Fed meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday. So the calendar might line up pretty well with a similar rally to what we saw in uh, early October. And then we have to digest uh, whatever uh, Powell and company will be telling us. So overall, I would say still in a downtrend until proven otherwise. Talk about a couple individual names here just to, uh, to finish off. And as a reminder, drop your comments in the uh, or your questions in the chat. Uh, for the remainder of the show here in a minute or two, we will go 
all from the, uh, the live chat. So get your questions in. Anything is fair game about technical indicators, about particular charts you're looking at, any of the charts we've been sharing or guest conversations we've been having, all that's fair game. Uh, or anything we haven't covered, happy to, uh, happy to go wherever you guys like. On Semiconductor, the biggest loser in the S&P 500 today, down about 22%. And, you know, again, on has been struggling a bit in the fact that it's been making a pattern of lower lows and lower highs. Look at how it failed to regain the 50-day moving average. Last week, really two weeks ago, uh, approached the 200-day moving average and failed to hold that. Today, of course, gapping lower on earnings, accelerating lower through the course of the day. And I think that tells you a lot about the uh, sentiment around this name. We gapped down here around 73 but through the course of the day, just accelerated to the downside. So not a lot of buyers coming in and, and thrilled to buy on Semiconductor back at the April low. It was more of a, let me get out of the way because I have no idea what's going to happen next, but probably not good, is the way I would generally describe today's, uh, today's price action. Now, the SMH on isn't a big enough weight in the SMH to really cause that to change. But it's worth noting that semiconductor stocks, of course, have been dropping along with most other things, kind of in this consistent downtrend channel of lower lows and lower highs. We're on the lower end of that range, lower end of that, uh, of that channel, right at the 200-day moving average. So you know, I, overall, I would say as a swing trader, this makes a ton of sense for a bit of a bounce off of these lows. Uh, but again, is that a big reversal higher? I certainly am not seeing any, enough of that, uh, enough evidence to support that. Um, is this the, you know, is this a counter trend move? I would say that's a safe bet to, uh, to, uh, to sort of make a play on. McDonald's, one of the better names today uh, after earnings. They reported uh, before the open today uh, and, uh, and did quite well. End of the day, it ended up being kind of a doji candle, open and close. Ended up at the same uh, same point now. That way, that is higher, about 1.7 percent from Friday's close. So that's encouraging, but not a huge upswing, right? Again, and, and again, this is a challenge I found with a lot of names that have had good earnings releases. And, and someone was asking last week about like Alphabet and how I described earnings. I tend to keep it super simple, and I'd say it's an earnings win if you went up around earnings. It's an earnings miss if you went down around earnings, regardless of whether or not. Um, you know, um, it's more about, you know, less about revenues, top line, bottom line. I think at the end of the day, was that earnings release a positive catalyst for the stock or a negative catalyst for the stock? And what concerns me are some of these names that have actually had a pretty decent report or, you know, there was sort of an assumption that things were going to get better from here. You're really not seeing upside follow through on some of those winning earnings names. Now, some of them, again, a handful for certain, but the average name for every Amazon's kind of bounced higher on earnings or an alphabet. There's a lot of names that, uh, like an alphabet, that, that have struggled to, uh, to hold those uh, previous gains. I want to highlight with something like McDonald's, and again, when we're talking about earnings, I would encourage you to think about not just the earnings release, but think about the big picture. When I'm looking at a chart like McDonald's, McDonald's had a pretty significant bottom here in March of 2002, so a little different than uh, the overall market environment. And if you take that low, the pretty significant low there in March, you take it to the high there in April, May, which was, again, retested there in uh, June and July, 38.2% of the way down is around 268. 61.8% of the way down is right about there. And just look at how well that lines up with, that's not the one that I wanted, horizontal line. There we go. Look at how well that lines up with that Fibonacci level, right? The low that we had in October. So I've often found Fibonacci relationships are helpful just to give structure to your analysis of the chart. And when you have a stock in a free fall, when you have a stock that's just accelerating, Identifying some of these key levels where you may find support can be, can be valuable. Look at what happens. We approach this level of support. The RSI became oversold. We finally came out of that oversold region uh, about two weeks ago. From there, we've popped up. So nice earnings uh, this week, and, and maybe that is enough to propel this stock and uh, push it back to the, uh, to the upside. 50-day moving average, Fibonacci resistance around 268. That might be that next upside objective I've been looking at. And it's all about holding this level, that 246 to 250 level on any sort of pullback. That's it for our market recap. And again, a lot of individual names to think about. We've got the Fed. We've got a lot to, uh, to think about. So any questions as you want to do it, uh, hit, them in the, uh, hit them in the chat. We'll, we'll hit that for a moment. Uh, before we get there, by the way, as a reminder, we have a mailbag always open. Uh, you are welcome to send questions any time of the day or night. Email is always appropriate. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We've heard from so many of you with great questions. Have you, you've been trying to use the Stock Charts platform to better understand these markets. Let us help you uh, by pointing you in the right direction. Also, on our YouTube channel, on any of the videos, just put a comment below the video you're watching. We capture all of those, and we will hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag probably later this week. 
All right, let's get to the live Q&A. And again, thank you guys so much for participating. Thanks for uh, making Final Bar Nation an active discussion community. Well, I hope to do more and more of these interactive elements. And let's get to the questions. As we go on, where's Dave? I am here, although again, I'm, I'm surprised if any of you that can see me, well done. It's not easy. Not everyone can. Some people get very frustrated trying to find me here in the studio. Marty asks, how important is volume and measuring volume in a reversal? That's a really good question. And I would say, <laughs> I'm going to give you the, the Dave Keller answer, which is not super important. Um, others that you may ask would have a very different answer to that, and I totally respect the difference of opinion. It's sort of a debated topic in the industry. I know John Bollinger has uh, uh, spoken a number of times, and I've talked to him about the importance of volume, and his idea, his thinking is that we've actually underappreciated the value of volume because there, it's a whole data series that we could uh, maybe uh, start to uh, improve our analysis of and, and maybe update our tools for. I, you know, on the other hand, I get my experience starting in the industry in around 2000 to where we're at now in 2023. When I was starting in the industry, they were just moving, um, you know, to decimalization, finishing that transition from, you know, trading in fractions to trading in decimals, uh, and uh, and then we have dark pools, high frequency trading. Um, uh, all sorts of algorithmic trading, um, you know, the, the decline of the regional exchanges, the decline of physical exchanges, the rise of, you know, electronic uh, exchanges and, and all sorts of things. All of those things, I would argue, have, a, have adjusted what volume represents uh, in, in some, some cases in very small ways, other places in pretty, uh, pretty big ways. And, and I think in a lot of ways that, uh, that we don't really even understand as, it, as it's happening, it's more how things evolve over time. I would tell you this, if you are going to look at volume, I'll give, you, I'll give you some thoughts on what you should do. So first off, if you are going to look at volume, I would encourage you on stock charts, it's good to overlay it and I would do color volume. Um, and the reason why that's helpful is basically because uh, what this does is it color codes the volume based on the price change, right? So if the, um, depending on how you have your, your login set up, um, you know, a, uh, in this case, the red bars are up days. The black bars represent down days. You can change all the colors and, and stuff that you're using uh, on our platform. But overall, this is basically telling you, uh, is, uh, is the market moving on greater volume, is mar market moving higher or lower on stronger volume than normal? And that's what you generally want to do, is look at a move in the price and then glance down to see if that is validated by a stronger volume rating. And the idea is, if you see a big move in price on lighter volume, that should be suspect. Um, the issue I have is if you look at volume readings, particularly on the higher level, looking at like the S&P, I've not found a great relationship. There have been plenty of times where it's looked like the volume is lighter than normal, but it really hasn't had the cataclysmically negative impact that you think it might uh, based on what I was taught early on in my technical analysis uh, uh, career. So I've, I've paid less and less attention to individual moves and spikes in volume for that, for that matter. Now, I would tell you, some measures of volume are pretty interesting. And the chart that, oh boy, how quickly can I find the chart? I'm not gonna be able to. So what I will do is just create it for you. Indicators that I would suggest you think about would be like on balance volume, um, check in money flow. So these are indicators that instead of like on balance volume, what it does is instead of just saying, okay, the stock moved, what's the volume? Okay, the next day the stock moved, what's the volume? On balance volume actually changed together those volume readings over time. And if it's an up close, that volume is added to the running total. If it's a down close, it's subtracted from the, from the running total. So when the market is going higher, if you see the market make higher highs and the on-balance volume starts to rotate lower, uh, like you saw here at the beginning of 2022, that should be a cause for concern, right? The market going higher and higher over time, but the on-balance volume rotating lower means there's less volume on the up days than the volume on the down days. And that usually means investors are selling into strength, not the opposite if you would see it at the low. Um, check in money flow and other indicators like that uh, have a little more nuanced way of calculating that price to volume relationship. So in this case, it's looking at where we trade in a range and then weighting the volume based on that. So I think uh, something getting to something like on balance volume or ideally something like a check in money flow is a great way to glance down. And I would say this is a way you validate what you saw with the price. Price is king. Price is most important. But look down at indicators like this. These are indicators that I would consider confirmation. Are they validating what you're seeing in your analysis uh, of price? That is my somewhat long-winded but hopefully helpful answer to how important uh, volume is. And again, the general, the, the, what you will read in a book is price moves on heavier volume. That is a move to be trusted. Price moves on lower volume. That is a move not to be trusted. I've gotten away from day-to-day -day volume readings and looked at more uh, you know, indicators that control or, or analyze volume over time. 
Next question, where are the QQQs after a slight bounce? Is it, is it a bull trap or a short-term oversold bounce? You probably answered this question if you listened to the beginning of the, of the show. I mean, I, so again, and again, I, I think that the way that you make sense of this sort of market, I tend to think what's the primary trend, right? For me, the primary trend means what time frame, what, what is the trend that I'm trying to analyze? So for me, it's about one to three months on average is kind of the lookout period that I'm thinking about. And uh, what I'm trying to do is just look at the evidence and see what I'm most expecting, what's the most likely move based on the trend that I've seen so far. And I assume that the trend is going to continue until I get some evidence that that's changing, right? That something is going to, uh, to change. So when I'm looking at the QQQ and I see it bouncing off of a new low, I'm going to assume that that is a bear market rally, that, that is a contrarian bounce, um, uh, as you sort of described it, a short-term oversold bounce. That's how I would think of it. And, and what would I need to see to say that it's something different? Again, I think because the market is guilty and so proven innocent, I think you need to regain the 50-day moving average. I think you need to put in a higher low. I think you need to see the RSI get above 60. Those are all the things that would tell me we are changing from a distribution phase to an accumulation phase. And if you want, as an example, I mean, look back at like October, November, December, January, uh, back here, right in the middle of the chart. Look at how the RSI was in this sort of negative range, right? Gets down to oversold conditions in September. On the rally in November, the RSI remains below uh, 60. So this is still telling me we're in a bearish phase. Look at how all that changed in January. We uh, broke out. We made, you know, at least a, we did not make a lower low, uh, maybe not a higher low, but, you know, kind of consistent. And then we broke out above moving average resistance. The RSI pushed above 60 and actually got overbought. So when that happens, that overbought reading is usually a pretty encouraging sign because it tells you things are actually, there's actually buyers coming in and pushing price to the upside. That is why in August of last year, I remember being really excited about the RSI getting above 60. It felt like it was the beginning of something further. In the end, we never really got above the 200 day. We never followed through after that initial signal. And then we got right back into the bearish uh, bearish trend. It changed in February because we did get above the 200 day. Uh, the RSI did get well above 60. And, uh, and then again, pullbacks made a higher low, RSI around 40. And so you could see that the market had rotated. So I would tend to assume that this is a contrarian bounce. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get a, bounce in, get a bit of a bounce into the Fed meeting. There's always been some optimism I hear, I think, recently about what we might hear from the Fed. If you look at what the futures market is pricing in, by the way, for the, for the Fed, it's you know, pretty much almost 100% chance there's no change this week. Uh, then the next meeting is mid-December and uh, you know, most likely no change there, although there's about a quarter, quarter 25% chance, uh, it was what I was looking at this morning, uh, of a 25 basis point hike in, uh, uh, then. But those, those uh, pro probabilities will probably change after the Fed meeting this week. But overall, the market is not expecting any change. It's going to be more about the language that they use. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some optimism going into Wednesday. And then we'll see between that and earnings what sort of catalyst we get after that. Hi, Dave. What would you say are the key fundamental metrics that set apart the Magnificent Seven from all others? It's a bit of a loaded question because you're assuming that I think that they are being set apart from all others. But I, I can't disagree with you, uh, Jeff. I really appreciate that question. You know, what's interesting is if you think about, and, and we've talked about some of the previous, uh, and, and, and again, it's all a jumble of when, when we've talked about some of these things, but when you think about market history, right, think about the 2007 peak. If you were investing at that point and you remember what that was, that was sort of pre-financial crisis, sort of like the end of the bull market, which ended up being the financial crisis. We didn't really know it yet. But if you look at what happened in 2007, major benchmarks rotating lower, um, but names like Pepsi were still going higher. And that's pretty common. If you look back at 2000, you saw defensive stocks actually holding up a lot better than sort of the previous leadership names, the you know, emerging technology names, which were all getting crushed as the tech bubble burst. Usually at the end of a bullish phase, you get this rotation into really defensive stocks because investors still want to own equities, but you're rotating to the defensive part of equities. You're going into utilities or real estate or consumer staples, kind of those economically um, immune, right? Even if economic conditions are pretty rough, you still need to power your house, you still need a house, you still need clothes, you still need cleaning products and all those sorts of things. And that's kind of the argument. In 2023, you haven't seen consumer staples do particularly well, even as the market has rolled over times when the market has not done well. Staples have not been a great place to be, generally speaking. But what has been a great place to be has been those mega cap, um, magnificent seven stocks. I would say there is a double whammy 
maybe a triple, a trifecta of why the Magnificent Seven stocks are doing so well. Number one, they dominate, right? They dominate. They have been allowed, I would argue, to dominate and really monopolize a particular area of the modern economy, whether it's social media or cloud computing or how we communicate or how we store things. One of those companies has come to dominate a particular area of that space, and it's allowed them to get so big that they are you know, relatively immune from, not immune, but definitely uh, less rocked by uh, you know, market movements and economic changes because they have so much, usually so much cash on hand, they've got a lot of resources to bring to bear, and they can weather uncertain times. So I think that's part of it. Uh, number two, I would argue they're the defensive plays of 2023, right? When you think about where you can hide out, if the market is uncertain, I don't, you know, if you don't feel like buying Hershey's or a food products name, something like an Apple, which has pretty much shown that it can grow in a lot of different environments, something like Microsoft that has been good in up markets and down markets, that seems like a great place to, uh, to hide out. And obviously, there's such a big weight that you really don't want to be wrong and not own them if they're going to continue to do well. The third thing I would say uh, with those, uh, those big technology companies um, is that, uh, I forgot the third thing. We'll go with those two. <laughs> I think those are the two that I would probably come up with. I mean, it's, it's a defensive play, and they've been allowed to sort of uh, uh, dominate, uh, I, I think, our, uh, our thinking. That's the third one, the AI craze. I think uh, names like NVIDIA and uh, Alphabet and others, you know, who's going to benefit most from AI? The market sort of told you in a lot of ways it's some of those established companies that have all the money to spend on R&D, that have you know, platforms that they can roll out AI uh, improvements as they make them. So I think that's the three reasons why they've, uh, they've done so well. And arguably, I, if I want to own stocks, I'm probably going to have some of the Magnificent Seven, probably not Tesla at the moment, but the others I would probably get an argument for. Um, Matrix of Compassion, yes, I did grow up in Cleveland um, and I was torn yesterday. Uh, those that were there uh, would have seen we had one Seahawks pom-pom and one Browns pom-pom. We were passing them around. We actually, my whole family was mixed in terms of our garb, but uh, we uh, we tried to cheer for everyone. It was uh, it was we were we were torn the whole time, but it was an awesome game, by the way. Let's see, uh, Randall. The current market environment is leading to odd new clothing styles. Is the oddness of the outfit similar to the rise and fall of hemlines with the market? The measure of the last century. That's actually fantastic. The hemline indicator, well documented. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this, Google hemline indicator. It's a fascinating thing uh, where you look at basically the average length of of uh, skirts and how that actually went with the market. I mean, it really did. There are other things that are kind of head scratchers, but kind of not. One of them is uh, popular music. And I know Bob Prechter and the team at Elliott Wave International created this video years ago, and I hope they still have it on a website somewhere, where it showed the most popular song every month or every year going back in market history. And it had a chart of the S&P 500, the Dow, and it played the music. And what's interesting is if you think back through popular music, the 1960s, you kind of had this like 50s into 60s, kind of everything's good, life is great, you do doo-wop kind of stuff, and the market's doing quite well. All of a sudden, 60s into 70s, you get into a lot of like anti-war music, kind of depressing, a lot of minor keys, a lot of, you know, Simon Garfunkel sounding things, market stagnating in the 1980s, you have the bubblegum era, you know, walking on sunshine type of stuff. It actually maps pretty well. So there is something to be said there. As much as that seems uh, funny and like it's a random thing, I would argue, and I think what Prechter argues, uh, is that it's social mood, right? Our, our, our sense as humans, as a culture, uh, uh, in popular culture, it reflects the sentiment of, uh, of investors, of, of people. And, and investors are doing the buy and sell decisions. So if we're all optimistic, or we're all depressed, that's going to be reflected in stock prices. So it's a bit of a stretch, but I think there is something to uh, to there. My outfit, I would say, unrelated to that, but uh, but uh, agreed. Um, let's see. We'll skip. We'll skip some of these. Um, yes, as a Browns fan, I am. I have very thick skin. Uh, I, I told people at the game. Yes, I've I've seen this many times. It's okay. Uh, let's see. Staying away from Apple. Peter asks. Staying away from Apple until its earnings. The chart is bad. I I appreciate and honor the simplicity in your question. Uh, you're saying the chart is bad. I can't disagree with you in terms of if I had to give a you know green light or red light, I probably would put a red light on this one. Again, it's it's similar to the rest of the market, but I think Apple tells you a lot about the short-term rotation we saw and what I would call a change of character. Look at what January through July looked like. Look what August through October has looked like. Obviously very different, right? Now, what think about specifically what makes the chart different on the left side to the right side. 
Higher highs, higher lows, momentum in a positive range, relative strength improving. We're above two upward sloping moving averages. This is a stock that I would always call it long and strong up and to the right. It's just working. We gapped lower in early August, and now we've made lower highs and lower lows. We're now below a downward sloping 50 day. We're actually right at the 200 day as of uh, today's close, but you know that's after closing below the 200 day on Thursday. Uh, and uh, the RSI now clearly in a, in a bearish range. Now we're not really underperforming too much because the average stock is kind of having a similar pullback over the last, uh, in the third quarter. Uh, having said that though, I think Apple, and again, until proven otherwise, I would argue that uh, the chart is down. Um, now, earnings, uh, and again, one of the challenges with it, trading individual stocks are the quarterly earnings report. And usually you expect uh, excess volatility, a lot of uncertainty, and a, in a lot of ways, a binary outcome, right? Is there a chance that Apple reports earnings and changes less than half a percent from the previous day's close? Maybe that is possible. Is it much more likely that it's either really great news or really bad news? Yeah, and, and that's the reality of earnings, right? It's always, here is the expectation, and then here's where we came in. And we're rarely right at that number. Um, it's usually some surprise to the upside or downside, which is why you often have a gap on the, uh, on the chart here. Now, if you look, early August was one of those earnings that really told us that the rally in the first part of the year was starting to end. Companies like Apple, Microsoft was right around the same time, gapping down, trading lower, I think told you a lot about a, a change of character. So I think this one could equally be as, uh, as impactful. Would I take a position on Apple going into earnings, looking at the chart? I absolutely would not because that's not something I would tend to want to do. I would much rather be patient and see if there's enough optimism after earnings to tell me there's more potential for a sustained move uh, after that. Uh, talk about needing thick skin. You take a position right before earnings and then bet on a binary outcome. I um, take a shot if that is what you're comfortable with. Definitely not mine. So I would be staying away and seeing how things uh, come out. I'm, I'm skeptical, honestly. I think a lot of the um, negative rotation we saw in the last uh, last couple months was from last quarter's earnings and, and companies really starting to acknowledge the impact of high inflation and high interest rates. And we're still kind of there here three months later. Let's see, have you noticed uh, a different behavior and character to the rhythms and short-term movements of the market with the proliferation of better and better institutional AI computer trading? Do I think that institutional AI trading computers take into account and learn to trade against retail trader psychology? That could be the subject of like an all-day offsite uh, that maybe someday I will I will create, but not today. Um, so my my quick answer to your question, really thoughtful question. I love how you're thinking about some of these market structural impacts. I would tell you, I think a lot of times individual investors overestimate the impact of big institutions doing um, you know doing algorithmic trading and AI driven anything. And while AI is more of a newer thing. Companies and big money managers have been experimenting with AI long before you probably were aware of what it was and what what why it might be helpful. I mean, that's been the game is trying to get an edge any way that you can, and using technology has been a, a common way to try to do that. And I, I know that from years ago, working with big institutions, you're always looking to find because you don't have access to information that was your edge 50 years ago. Now it's 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 capabilities and it's resources, and so. You know, using those, I think, has been uh, has been pretty pretty common. For at a buy side desk, at the average buy side desk at a large firm, most of their trading, I would argue, probably at this point, is done automatically, is done algorithmically uh, with different versions of things. Uh, often, just trying to beat an average price of VWAP during the course of the day. So, um, what what I would tell you is, if you're a day trader, I would say that the the world has very much changed. I would say that is a very crowded space. Um, the technology is so good. I think you're fighting some really powerful forces to try to get an edge on that time frame. That's not the time frame I operate on, and that's part of you know years ago as I was looking at where I thought an edge could be. That definitely felt like a space where there was a shrinking edge to be had. Um, medium term, long term, I would argue there still is uh, there are plenty of opportunities, and your ability to rotate and recognize changes and capitalize on those, I think, is uh, is, is still is still very much uh, still very much there. Um, the rest of your question, do uh, AI computers take into account retail trader psychology? I mean, to a degree. I mean, if you think about what data an AI um, um, of any sort would use to come up with a trading system, it would be based on price and volume. The same things that you and I are looking at, just doing it in a lot of different ways. Um, the, again, the challenge with any sort of machine learning or AI is it's only as good 
as the information you put in. They always say garbage in, garbage out. And I would say we are overestimating. And I think the, you know, we saw a chat G GPT and OpenAI has shown you. It's like it was told, we were told it was going to be, you know, uh, completely transformational. In some ways it has been, but in other ways it's like, it's still not giving you, and it's still not talking to the Star Trek computer. We're not quite there yet, obviously, right? With voice recognition and AI and all that. Like we're, we're just still not there. It's very good at tricking us into thinking it's a lot better than it is. And I would argue, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about big institutions and AI killing your edge as an investor. I think there's still plenty of opportunity there. Uh, just to finish off here, last question. Um, Eccentric CCC says, what are your thoughts about Dow theory confirming this is a start of a bear market where fears beget more fear? Um, I think that's super important. Um, I would, would I say traditional Dow theory uh, probably not. In my Mindful Investor Live chart list, which you guys can all access on uh, stockcharts.com on my blog called The Mindful Investor, um, there's a couple different things you can do with, uh, with Dow theory. I mean, traditional Dow theory is looking at the Dow industrials and the Dow transports. And that's, that's not looking particularly good because transports have been so weak. But I would say the S&P and the NASDAQ and what I now call the newer Dow theory, the new, new Dow theory would be equal weighted S&P, equal weighted NASDAQ. I think this speaks the best to what Charles Dow was originally trying to accomplish, which is looking at different parts of the economy and whether they were in agreement or not. Um, these are trending downwards, right? And they have been over the last couple months. They've both broken to new swing lows and continued to do so. They've both, both broken below key trend lines, right? Uh, just like the S&P, uh, the, the, the regular index did. I mean, these equal weighted versions broke down in September and have continued to go lower. So as long as these keep making new lows together, the market's in a downtrend. What I am looking for is when one of these makes a new low and the other one does not. That's called a bullish non-confirmation. And that would be an interesting development to, uh, to see on the Dow theory chart, but we're not seeing it yet. So for now, I would say Dow theory, along with a, a breadth indicators and a lot of other risk measures I could, uh, I could point out to you overall, still very much in the distribution phase here. Guys, awesome questions. Thank you so much for all of those. Thanks for keeping it uh, active in here and, uh, and sharing some thoughts. Any of the questions we didn't get to, we'll put them in the mailbag and in our next mailbag segment, hopefully we can get to that one next. We have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. We'll go quickly through one, two, three. Chart number one, I mentioned uh, the market being guilty until proven innocent. I think biotechs are a great example of that. And again, you can see, I mean, someone mentioned in the chat, the chart looks bad. And I would agree, right? If I showed my seven-year-old son, Henry, this chart and said, is it going up or down? I bet he would be able to correctly answer, it is going down. But think about what the technical toolkit can do to help you better classify this and what more importantly would tell you that the trend is different. We're below two downward sloping moving averages. That would need to change. We're making lower lows and lower highs. That would need to change. The RSI clearly in the distribution phase, that would have to be different. The relative strength is going to new lows. That would have to rotate higher. So there are things on this chart that confirm the trend is down. I think there are also indicators on this chart which are not triggered yet, which could tell you something like biotechs are starting to work. But until they do, I would assume that the trend is still going lower. Chart number two, trucking was one of the groups that was actually doing okay today. It was up a couple percent. Now, with ODFL and other trucking companies, a lot of these are bouncing off of pretty beaten down levels. ODFL actually became oversold at the 200-day moving average last week, today bouncing off of there. So that is actually interesting to me. When you think about a catalyst, right, bouncing off of technical support, oversold and now out of that region, I don't mind taking a short-term play on something like this betting on mean reversion. But again, let's separate mean reversion, a short-term bounce, from something more of a rotation to more of a bullish phase. And I still haven't seen enough on that chart to, uh, to declare that sort of thing. Finally, ratios are always interesting to, uh, to look at. SPY versus GLD is looking at stocks versus gold. Now, this has been going down quite a bit in the last couple of weeks because stocks, of course, are languishing a bit and gold rotated higher on a potential short covering rally uh, that happened through the month of uh, October. This ratio now oversold. And if you look back at previous times when the ratio is oversold with the RSI below 30, that usually means we get a bounce back to the upside. Does this mean gold pulls back a bit after uh, you know, trying to test uh, new highs and stocks kind of rally off of their lows? Potentially, I would keep an eye on that ratio to see if that continues to bounce higher. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.